This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today I'm going to continue, I think, in the sixth reading already of the book by Patrick van Limborch, a Dutch person who wrote in 1692 the book The History of the Inquisition. I try not to go too far away from the subject that... Um, I planned to read today, which is in the book, the continuation of uh, the secret history, uh, the, the secret, <laughs> the history of the Inquisition. It's no secret, but <laughs> it's unknown to most people today because it is not taught in the schools and it surely is not taught in the churches anymore. And therefore, I committed myself to work through this very hard to read and sometimes also hard to understand book written in the end of the 17th century and translated into English in the beginning of the 18th century by Samuel Chandler. I hope you all enjoy what I read so far and will stick with me all through the book to learn a lot of real history. And when we are talking about real history, when we're going to continue here on the page uh, 33, um, it starts that I write not these things out of any aversion to the memory or particular principles of Athanasius. And we already have read a lot of Athanasius and I thought it would be interesting to tell you who Athanasius is. So I looked him up on Wikipedia. He's called Athanasius of Alexandria and I will put the link uh, of this Wikipedia research into the description box of the video so that you can look it up for yourself and study it for yourself. Here on the right hand you have a picture of so-called Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, well, the Pope of Alexandria of that time. And we can read through his uh, 
biography and everything else and I found one sentence here that I found quite interesting and I want to share that with you because when we read that we have an understanding what kind of person um, this uh, Athanasius, Saint Athanasius was. It says here in Wikipedia, he embraced a subordinist uh, sub Christology which taught that Christ was the divine son or the logos of God made not begotten. As a Bible believing Christian you do not need to read more to understand what spirit was leading quote unquote Saint Athanasius. When he embraced Christology which taught that Christ was the divine son made not begotten. That is absolutely against the Bible. So keep all this in mind while we are reading uh, the book The History of the Inquisition and um, I think it's quite interesting also to go through this Wikipedia article but I leave you to it for yourself because I cannot do everything and you know you have to do a little bit of your own research too so you can start with a uh, reading of who was Saint Athanasius of Alexandria the Pope of Alexandria which we were speaking about here in the book reading but the most important thing of him to know is that we read that he embraced a Christology which taught that Christ was the divine son the logos of God but he was made and not begotten that is anti-biblical so when we read in the book now and we learn of Saint Anathasius a little bit more in the coming reading that is coming up right now then you know what spirit led Saint Anathasius okay I thought that was a quite interesting and need to know basis of introduction so I'm gonna start reading and here and there I'm gonna take a little break because I have to drink my my ginger water for my health mean meanwhile I'm reading so let's continue the next reading starting here because this is where we yesterday left off the day before I'm just gonna repeat this last sentence here it is needless to produce more instances of this kind whosoever gives himself the trouble of looking over any of the wor uh, of the writings of this father will find in them the most uh, furious invectives against the Arians and that he studiously endeavors to represent them in such colors as might render them the abhorrence of mankind and excite the world to their utter exportation. I write not, the author continues, these things out of any aversion to the memory or peculiar principles of Athanasius. Whether I agree with him or differ from him in opinion, I think myself equally obliged to give impartially the true account of him. Where well, we already read a little bit in Wikipedia what the true account of Anastasius is. And as this which I have given of him is drawn partly from history and partly from his own writings, I think I cannot be justly charged with misinterpreting him. No. Dear Mr. Limborch, we are also not accusing you of taking parts or misinterpreting Anasadius. But to speak plainly, the author continues, I think, says Limborch, that Athanasius was a man of an haughty and inflexible temper, and more concerned for victory and power than for truth, religion or peace. The word consubstantial that was inserted into the Nicene Creed and the anathema denounced against all who would or could not believe in it furnished matter for endless debates. Those who were against it censured as, blas uh, censured as blasphemers those who used it and as denying the proper substance of the sun and as falling into the Sibelian heresy. The consubstantials 
on the other side reproached their adversaries as heathens and with bringing in the polytheism of the Gentiles. And though they equally denied the, conse the consequences which their respective principles were charged with, yet as the Orthodox would not part with the word consubstantial, and the Arians could not agree to the use of it, they continued their unchristian reproaches and accusations of each other. Athanasius would yield to no terms of peace nor receive any into communion who would not absolutely submit to the decisions of the fathers of Nicaea. In his letter to Johannes and uh, Antiochus, he exhorts them to hold fast the confession of those fathers and to reject all who should speak more or less than was contained in it. And in his first oration against the Arians, he declares the, in plain terms, quote, that the expressing of a person's sentiments in the words of Scripture was no sufficient proof of orthodoxy, because the devil himself used Scripture words to cover his wicked designs upon our Saviour. And even farther, that heretics were not to be received, though they made use of the very expressions of orthodoxy itself." Unquote. With one of so suspicious and jealous a nature that could, uh, that could scarce be any possible terms of peace, it being extremely unlikely that without some kind of allowances and mutual abatements, so wide a breach could ever be compromised. Even the attempts of Constantine himself to soften Athanasius and reconcile him to his brethren had no other influence upon him than to render him more imperious and obstinate. For after Arius had given in such a confession of his faith his satis uh, as satisfied the emperor and no, sorry, for after Arius had given in such a confession of his face uh, as satisfied the emperor and expressly denied many of the principles he had been charged with, and thereupon humbly desired the emperor's in, uh, interposition that he might be restored to the communion of the church, Athanasius, out of hatred to his enemy, flatly denied the emperor's request and told him it was impossible for, for those who had once rejected the faith and were anathematized, anathematized ever to be wholly restored. So when you are once anathematized, you can never be wholly restored. That's what he thinks about. Keep this in mind because there comes a very interesting history about Athanasius in the future reading that we can read here, because he has been anathematized and been thrown out of his quote-unquote see, yeah, his bishopric see, several times. And he says that those who were anathematized never to be wholly restored. Yeah, making up rules for others, but do not comply to them for yourself, right? But let's continue. This so provoked the Emperor Constantine that he threatened to depose and banish him unless he submitted to his order, which he shortly after did by sending him into France upon the accusation of several bishops who, as Socrates intimates, were worthy of credit, that he had said he would stop the corn that was yearly sent to Constantinople from the city of Alexandria. To such an height of pride was this bishop now arrived, e as even to threaten the sequestration of the revenues of the empire. Constantine also apprehended that this step was necessary to the peace of the church, because Athanasius absolutely refused to communicate with Arius and his followers. Soon after these transactions, Arius died. And the manner of his death, as it was reported by the Orthodox, Athanasius thinks of, its, uh, of itself sufficiently, of itself sufficient fully to condemn the Arian heresy, and an evident proof that it was hateful to God. Nor did Constantine himself survive him. He was succeeded by his three sons, 
Constantine, Constantius and Constance. Constantine, the eldest, recalled Athanasius from banishment and restored him to his bishopric, upon which account there arose most grievous quarrels and seditions, many being killed and many publicly whipped by Athanasius' order, according to the accusations of his enemies. Constantius, after his elder brother's death, convened a synod at Antioch in Syria, where Athanasius was again deposed for these crimes, and Gregory put into the see of Alexandria. In this council a new creed was drawn up, in which the word consubstantial was wholly omitted, and the expressions made use of so general as that they might have been equally agreed to by the Orthodox and Arians. In the close of it several anathemas were added, and particularly upon all and particularly upon all who should teach or preach otherwise than what this council had received, because, as they themselves say, quote, they did really believe and follow all things delivered by the Holy Scriptures, both prophets and apostles. Unquote. So that now the whole Christian world was under a synodical curse, the opposite councils having damned one another and all that different from them. And if councils as such have any authority to anathematize all who will not submit to them, this authority equally belongs to every council, and therefore it was but a natural piece of revenge that as the council of Nice had sent all the Arians to the devil, the Arians in their turn should take the Orthodox along with them for company and thus repay one anathema with another. Now, there is a writing from Martin Luther from 1520, that of course is far in the future from the time that we are speaking about here, because we are speaking about the 4th century. But there is a writing from Martin Luther from 1520 that is called um, to the German uh, nobility on the Christian uh, 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 to, 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 the, to, the German, uh, to the German nobility in any way. Um, I, I don't remember the whole title now in my head, forgive me for that. You can look that up because I made two or three broadcasts in Hour of the Truth um, where I speak about this paper. And in that paper, uh, Martin Luther already said, because you know the, he said that the Roman Catholic Church built three walls around it to protect her, and the first walls are the synods and the councils. And he said, these councils have very often disagreed with each other. From 1870 on, we speak about the quote-unquote infallibility of the Pope, right? And uh, canon law is canon law and never changes, right? But how then can one council be saying one thing and another council saying another thing? The problem is that these councils have actually not always agreed on each other. And this is what just comes out here, what we are just reading here. And if councils as such have any authority to anathematize all who will not submit to them, this authority equally belongs to every council. And therefore it was but a natural piece of revenge that as the Council of Nice had sent, Nicaea means that, had sent... <coughs> All the Arians to the devil, the Arians in their turn, should take the Orthodox along with them for company and thus repay <coughs> and thus repay one anathema with another. So one council says this and another council says that. A house divided in itself cannot stand, says the Bible. Right? And I think that we have here already a very fine example of how the Roman Catholic Church is a house divided in itself. But let's continue on Constantine's son Constantius. Constantius himself was warmly in the Arian side. 
on the Arian side, and favoured the bishops of that party only, and ejected Paul, the Orthodox bishop from the see of Constantinople, as a person altogether unworthy of it. Macedonius being substituted in his room. Macedonius was in a different scheme, or at least expressed himself in different words, both from the Orthodox and Arians, and asserted that the Son was not consubstantial, but not of the same, but a like substance with the Father, and openly propagated this opinion after he had thrust himself into the bishopric of Paul. This the Orthodox party highly resented, opposing Hermogenes, whom Constantius has sent to introduce him, and in their rage burned down his house, and drew him round the streets by his feet, till they had murdered him. Isn't that Christian-like? Burned down his house, drew him round the streets by his feet, till they had murdered him? Didn't Christ say we should not do harm to any man, and we should not kill? Why doesn't anybody see this in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, in the early history of the Roman Catholic Church? Murdering, looting, and, of course, inquisition. But notwithstanding the Emperor's orders were thus opposed and his officers killed by the Orthodox party, he treated them with great lenity and in his instance punished them much less than their insolence and fury deserved. Soon after this, Athanasius and Paul were restored again to their respective Caesar. That is already the second time that Athanasius is restored in his former position. Soon after this, uh, 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 and upon Athanasius entering Alexandria, uh, great disturbances arose, which were attended with the destruction of many persons, meaning killing, and Anathasius accused of being the author of all those evils. Soon after Paul's return to Constantinople, he was banished from thence again by the emperor's orders, and Macedonius re-entered into possession of that see, that is an apostolic see, that is the bishopric, yeah? upon which occasion 3,150 persons were murdered, some by the soldiers and others being pressed to death by the crowd. Athanasius also soon followed him into banishment, being accused of selling the corn with, uh, which Constantine the Great had given for the support of the poor of the Church of Alexandria and putting the money in his own pocket, and being therefore threatened by Constantius with debt. But they were both a little while after recalled by Constans, the third son of Constantine, then banished again by Constantius, and Paul, as some say, murdered by his enemies, the Arians, as he was carrying into exile. Though as Athanasius himself owns, the Arians expressly denied it, and said that he died of some distemper. Macedonius, having thus gotten quiet possession out of, uh, of the see of Constantinople, prevailed with the emperor to publish a law by which those of the consubstantial or orthodox party were driven not only out of the churches but cities too and many of them compelled to communicate with the Arians by stripes and torments, by proscriptions and banishments, and other violent methods of severity. Upon the banishment of Athanasius, whom Constantius, in his letter to the citizens, citizens of Alexandria, calls an impostor, a corrupter of men's souls, a disturber of the city, a precious fellow, one convicted of the worst crimes, not to be expiated by his suffering death ten times, George was put into the see of Alexandria, meaning George took the see, the bishopric of 
Athanasius, whom the emperor in the same letter styles a most venerable person and the most capable of all men to entrust them in heavenly things. Though Athanasius, in his usual style, calls him an idolater and hangman, and one capable of all violences, rapines and murders, and whom he actually charges with committing the most impious actions and outrageous cruelties. Thus, as Socrates observes, was the church torn in pieces by a civil war for the sake of Athanasius and the world and the word consubstantial. That's what one word can actually do. The truth is that the Christian clergy were now become the chief incendiaries and disturbers of the empire, and the pride of the bishops and the fury of the people on each side were grown to such an height as that there scarce ever was an election or restoration of bishop in the larger cities, but it was attended with slaughter and blood. Athanasius was several times banished and restored, as I said a little bit earlier, and he said that when you are anathematized, which means banished, uh, put a ban on you, you cannot be restored, but he himself, Athanasius, was several times banished and restored at the expense of blood. The Orthodox were deposed, and the Arians substituted in their room with the murder of thousands, and of the controversy was, no, was now no longer about the plain doctrines of uncorrupted Christianity. No, it was no longer about the plain doctrines of uncorrupted, meaning apostolic Christianity, but it was all about power and dominion, high preferments, large revenues, money, 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 and secular honors. Agreeable hereto, the bishops were introduced into their churches and placed on their thrones by armed soldiers and, play and paid no regard to the ecclesiastical rules or the lives of their flocks, so they could get possession and keep out their adversaries. And when once they were in, they treated those who differed from them without moderation or mercy, turning them out of their churches, denying them the liberty of worship, putting them under an anathema, and persecuting them with innumerable methods of cruelty, as is evident from the accounts given by the ecclesiastical historians of Athanasius, Macedonius, George and others, which may be read at large in the forementioned places. In a word, they seem to treat one another with the same implacable bitterness and severity as ever the common enemies, the heathens, treated them, as though they thought that persecution for conscience sake had been, distinguishing, had been the distinguishing precept of the Christian religion, and that they could not more effectually recommend and distinguish themselves as the disciples of Christ than by tearing and devouring one, it, one another. This made Julian, the emperor, say of them, quote, that they found by experience that even beasts are not so cruel to men as the generality of Christians were to one another, unquote. Julian, the emperor, quoted here that even beasts are not so cruel to men as the generality of Christians were to one another. I'm going to tell you one thing. A beast, meaning an animal, what he means in this kind, whether it be, a, be, uh, it be some kind of like a bear or a tiger or a lion or whatever, is never cruel to man. He attacks man, he kills man, but he is not cruel. He does not torture but man does so. As the generality of Christians were to one another, well, here we have to distinguish between who are really Christians and who are just professing Christians. 
Professing Christians are those in the Roman Catholic Church, because we know the Roman Catholic Church is not Christianity, even from the beginning, from the beginning where we are talking here about. But the real Bible-believing, Jesus-following people are Christians. And the quote-unquote Christians from the Roman Catholic Church always persecuted the Christians who followed Jesus Christ. In a way that the Emperor Julian says here that even beasts are not so cruel to men as the generality of Christians were to one another. This was the unhappy state of the church in the region of Constantius. In the, oh, sorry, <laughs> this was the unhappy state of the church in the reign of Constantius, which affords us little more than uh, the history of councils and creeds differing from and contrary to each other. Bishops deposing, censuring and anathematizing their adversaries, and the Christian people divided into, fract into factions under their respective leaders, for the sake of words they understood nothing of the sense of, and striving for victory even to bloodshed and death. Upon the succession of Julian to the empire, though the contending parties could not unite against the common enemy, yet they were by the emperor's clemency and wisdom kept in tolerance, peace and order. The bishops, which had been banished by Constantius, his predecessor, he immediately recalled, ordered their effects, which had been confiscated, to be restored to them, and commanded that no one should injure or hurt any Christian whatsoever. <laughs> and commanded that no one should injure or hurt any Christian whatsoever. Who is the Christian? The one who is protected by Constantius who is protected by the Roman Emperor. That is what he calls a Christian. All the others are quote-unquote heretics, you know, heretics whom can be persecuted, of course. And as Ami, uh, Amianus, uh, and as Amianus Marcellinus, an heathen writer of those times tells us, he caused the Christian bishops and people who were at variance with, one each, uh, with each other to come into his palace and there admonished them that they should everyone profe uh, profess their own religion without hindrance or fear, provided they did not disturb the public peace by their divisions. This was an instance of great moderation and generosity and a pattern worthy the imitation of all his successors. So this is a little bit a different approach that this Roman Emperor Constantinus takes here. It was an instance of great moderation and generosity and a pattern worthy of the imitation of all his successors that people could profess their own religion without hindrance or fear, provided they did not disturb the public peace by their divisions. This is actually a moment where there was given completely religious freedom to Bible-believing Christians. As long means provided, as stands here in the book, provided they did not disturb the public peace by their divisions, well, a Bible-believing Christian does not disturb the public peace because he separates himself from the emperor and the reign of him. Yeah. This was an instance of great moderation and generosity and a pattern worthy the imitation of all his successors. So I guess we can <laughs> understand that Constantius did not reign for too long if he reigned in this way that he did not persecute the true Bible-believing Christians. Now in the beginning of Julian's reign, the author continues, some of the inhabitants of Alexandria and 
as was reported, the friends of Athanasius, by his advice, raised, at great tumult, uh, raised a great tumult in the city and murdered George, the bishop of the place, by tearing him in pieces and burning his body. Well, does that sound very Christian-like to you? I don't think so, right? Tearing him into pieces and burning his body. Upon which Athanasius returned immediately from his banishment and took possession of his see, turning out the Arians from their churches and forcing them to hold their assemblies in private and mean places. So, even though there was, as we just read, kind of religious liberty given by Constantius, in the beginning of Julian's reign, then Anastasius came back from his banishment, killed the bishop who took his place when he was banished, by tearing him into pieces and burning his body, and now turning out the Arians from their churches and forcing them to hold their assemblies in private and mean places. Julian, the Emperor Julian, with great equity, severely reproved the Alexandrians for this their violence and cruelty, telling them that, uh, that though George might have greatly injured them, yet they ought not to have revenged themselves on him, but to have left him to the justice of the laws. So, in other words, Julian is accusing the people of Alexandria of lynch of lynching when they teared George the reigning bishop of the place in pieces and burned his body the emperor calls this actually a lynch mob but to have left him to the justice of the laws not to revenge themselves on him yeah, what is that? That is lynching, when I revenge myself on somebody, but to have left him to the justice of the laws. Now, Athanasius, upon his restoration, immediately convened a synod in Alexandria, in which was first asserted the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Ha ha! What do we have here? The divinity of the Holy Spirit where is that in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is God? Here you see that Anastasius was very much involved with the Trinity. As you remember, we read here in Wikipedia, he embraced a subordinated Christology which taught that Christ was the divine God not, made but, uh, not begotten but made. And he also teaches that What we just read here, the Holy Spirit is God. There is not one verse in the Bible that you can look up that supports this. The Holy Spirit is not divine. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ and the Father. And he is the comforter and the replacement of Christ on earth as long as Christ went up to heaven before he comes down to consume his kingdom that he established 2,000 years ago. You know, the consummation spoken of in Daniel 9. But the Holy Spirit is not divine. The Holy Spirit had to be divine in this teaching here because they are teaching the Trinity. But that is not biblical. I'm going to read the sentence again to, for a better understanding for us all. But keep in mind, the Holy Spirit is not divine. Athanasius, upon his restoration, immediately convened a synod at Alexandria, 
in which was first asserted the divinity of the Holy Spirit and his consubstantiality with the Father and the Son. Meaning, when we complete the sentence that I just interrupted, the Holy Spirit is as divine as the Father, as the Son, and is completely and fully God. And that is a heretical Roman Catholic teaching. It is not supported by the Word of God. But this power, there was but, uh, but his power there was but short. For being accused to Julian as the destroyer of that city and all Egypt, he saved himself by flight. But soon after, secretly returned to Alexandria, where he lived in great privacy till the storm was blown over by Julian's death at the succession of Jovian to the empire, who restored him to his see, in which he continued undisturbed to his death. Although Julian behaved himself with great moderation upon his first accession to the imperial dignity towards the Christians, as well as others, yet his hatred to Christianity soon appeared in many instances. Remember, we are speaking about a Roman emperor who is acting now as the emperor of the pagan Roman Empire, in which Christianity was a few years before made the state religion. It was made the state religion and this emperor, Julian, hates the Christians. He has a hatred for Christianity. Let me repeat the sentence again that we very well understand that. Although Julian behaved himself with great moderation upon his first effect, uh, accession to the imperial dignity, towards the Christians as well as others, yet his hatred to Christianity soon appeared in many instances. Now let's see. How does his hate of Christianity manifest. For though he did not, like the rest of the heathen emperors, proceed to uh, sang uh, sanguinary laws, yet he commanded that the children of Christians should not be uh, instructed in the Grecian language and learning. By another edict he ordained that no Christian should bear any office in the army, nor have any concern in the distribution and management of the public revenues. <laughs> By another edict he ordained that no Christian should bear any office in the army. Well, for me, as a Bible-believing Christian, that is absolutely no problem. I don't even want to have any office in any army, except for the army of God, the God of the Bible. And that is not a carnal army, that is not an army that fights with carnal weapons. So by another edict he ordained that no Christian should bear any office in the army nor have any concern in the distribution and management of the public revenues. He taxed very heavily and demanded contributions from all who would not sacrifice to support the vast expenses he was at, the, uh, at in his eastern expeditions. And when the governors of the provinces took occasion from hence to oppress and plunder them, he dismissed those who complained with this scornful answer, quote, Your God hath commanded you to suffer persecution. Unquote. Ah, your God has commanded you to suffer persecution. Jesus Christ said that in for his name we will have persecution and we will be uh, persecuted in this world and we will have tribulation because we follow him. That does of course not give the governor the right to do this scornful answer. Your God hath commanded you to suffer persecution because it is still you, emperor, exercises the persecution. He also deprived the clergy of all their immunities, honors and revenues granted them by Constantine, 
abrogated the laws made in their favor in order they should be lifted amongst the numbers of uh, the number of soldiers. He destroyed several of their churches and stripped them of their treasure and sacred vessels. Some he punished with banishment and others with death under pretense of their having pulled down some of the pagan temples and insulted himself. The truth is that the Christian bishops and people showed such a turbulent and seditious spirit that it was no wonder that Julian should keep a jealous eye over them and, uh, and though otherwise a man of great moderation connive at the severities his officers sometimes practiced on them. Whether he would have proceeded to any farther extremities against them, had he returned victorious from his Persian expedition, as Theodoret affirms he would, cannot, I think, be determined. He was certainly a person of great humanity in his natural temper, but how far his own superstition and the imprudencies of the Christians might have altered his disposition, it is impossible to say. Thus much is certain that the behavior of the Christians towards him was in many instances very blamable, blamable and such as tended to irritate his spirit and awaken his resentment. But whatever his intentions were, he did not live to execute them, being slain in his Persian expedition. He was succeeded by Jovian, who was a Christian by principle and profession. Upon his return from Persia, the troubles of the church immediately revived, the bishops and heads of parties crowding about him, each hoping that he would lift on their, uh, that he would lis, uh, lift on their side and, uh, and grant the authority to oppress their adversaries. Athanasius, amongst others, writes to him in favor of the Nicene Creed and warns him against the blasphemies of the Arians. And though he doth not directly urge him to persecute them, yet he tells him that it is necessary to adhere to the decisions of that council concerning the faith, and that their creed was divine and apostolical, and that no man ought to reason or dispute against it, as the Arians did. A synod also of certain bishops met at Antioch in Syria. And though several of them had been opposers of the Nicene doctrine before, yet finding that this was the faith espoused by Jovian, they with great obsequiousness readily confirmed it, and subscribed it, and in a flattering letter sent it to him, representing that this true and orthodox faith was of the, greater, uh, was of this, uh, the great center of unity. The followers also of Macedonius, who rejected the word consubstantial and held the Son to be only like to the Father, most humbly besought him, and such who asserted the Son to be unlike the Father might be driven from their churches, and that they themselves might be put into them in their room, with the bishop's name subscribed to the petition. But Jovian, though himself in the orthodox doctrine, did not suffer himself to be drawn into measures of persecution by the arts of these temporizing prelates, but dismissed them civilly with this answer, quote, I hate contention and love those only that study peace, declaring that he would trouble none upon account of their faith, whatsoever it was, and that he would favor and esteem such only who should show themselves leaders in restoring the peace of the Church. Themistius, the philosopher in his oration upon Jovian's consulate, comments, commands him very justly on this account, that he gave free liberty to everyone to worship God as he would, and despised the flattering in, uh, insinuations of those who would have persuaded him of the use of violent methods concerning whom he pleasantly, but with too much truth, said that he found by experience that they worshipped not God, but the purple. 
scarlet and purple we know already from the book of Revelation. Yeah? That he found by experience that they worship not God, but the purple. That means man. Arianism leads to that. Because that is a man-centered gospel and not a Christ-centered gospel as the true gospel is. The two emperors, Valentinianus and Valens, who succeeded Jovian, were of very different tempers and embraced different parties in religion. The former, meaning Valentinius, uh, Valentinianus, the former, was of the orthodox side, and though he favored those most of uh, most uh, who were of his own sentiments, yet he gave no disturbance to the Arians, meaning he did not persecute them, he left them alone. He gave them religious liberty. On the contrary, Valens, his brother, was of a rigid and sanguinary disposition. Sanguinary, you have to understand that, of course, that is based on blood, you know, of your genealogy, we would say today and severely persecuted all who differed from him. In the beginning of their reign, a synod met in Elicrium, who again decreed the consubstantiality of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The consubstantiality of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Trinity. Three persons unbiblical. This the two emperors declared in a letter there assent to and ordered that this doctrine should be preached. However, they both published laws for the toleration of all religions, even the heathen and Arian. But Valens was soon prevailed on by the arts of Eudoxius, Bishop of Constantinople, to forsake both his principles of religion and moderation, and embracing the Arian party, he cruelly perfect, uh, per persecuted all those who were of the Orthodox party. The conduct of the Orthodox Synod met at uh, Lem Lempsicus was the first thing that enraged him, for having obtained of him leave to meet for the amendment and settlement of the faith, after two months' consultation, they decreed the doctrine of the Son's being like the Father, as to be, uh, as to his essence, to be orthodox, and deposed all the bishops of the Arian party. This highly exasperated Valens, who thereupon called a council of Arian bishops and commanded the bishops that composed the council at Lampicus to embrace the opinions of Eudoxius, the Arian, and upon their refusal immediately sent them into banishment and gave their churches to their enemies, sparing only Paulinus for the remarkable sanctity of his life. After this he entered into more violent measures and caused the Orthodox, some of them to be whipped, others to be disgraced, others to be imprisoned, and others to be fined. He also put great numbers to death, and particularly caused eighty of them at once to be put on board a ship, and the ship to be fired when it was sailed out of the harbour, where they miserably perished by the water and the flames. These persecutions he continued to the end of his reign, and was greatly assisted them by the bishop and and was greatly assisted in them by the bishops of the Arian party. So, don't think that the Arians were quote-unquote holy. Don't think that the Orthodox were quote-unquote holy. This is a fight like we see it today within the Roman Catholic Church from the left and the right wing within the Roman Catholic Church. Then it was called Orthodox side, and Arian side, 
and they fought against each other as they do today with the left and the right paradigm they do the same but eventually it's their main agenda it's satan's agenda that only advances you know these persecutions he continued to the end of his reign and was greatly um, afflicted by them uh, in them by the bishops assisted sorry was greatly assisted by them in them by the bishops of the Arian party in the meantime great disturbances happened at Rome Liberius bishop of that city bishop of Rome being dead Orsinus a uh, yeah Orsinus a deacon of that church and Damasus were both nominated to succeed him. The party of Damasus prevailed and got him chosen and ordained. Orsinus, being enraged that Damasus was preferred before him, set up separate meetings and at last procured himself to be privately ordained by certain obscure bishops. This occasioned great disputes amongst the citizens which should obtain the apocryphal dignity and the matter which were, was carried to such an height that great numbers were murdered in the quarrel on both sides no, no less than 137 persons being destroyed in the church itself according to Ammianus who adds quote, that it was no wonder to see those who were ambitious of human greatness contending with so much heat and animosity for that dignity because when they had obtained it they were sure to be enriched by the offerings of the matrons of appearing abroad in greater splendor of being admired to their costly coaches sumptuous in their feasts outdoing sovereign princes and the expenses of their tables Unquote. for which reason protectus protectatus sorry protectatus and heathen who was prefect of the city rome <laughs> the following year said make me bishop of rome and i'll be a christian too <laughs> For which reason Protextatus, a heathen who was prefect of Rome, the following year said, Make me bishop of Rome and I'll be a Christian too. That is what is called simony. Buying the position of Pope. Buying an ecclesiastical position, buying a position of power, that is simony. That word goes back to Simon the Sorcerer, who was the first one who wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit, as you can read in the book of Acts. Protextatus, a heathen, not a Christian, who was prefect of Rome the following year, said, Make me bishop of Rome! and I'll be a Christian too. Meaning, make, give me the position and I profess everything that you want to. Isn't that how the popes today work? Isn't that exactly the same thing that we have today? <laughs> the popes are not Christian, are they? <laughs> they are all heathens. This is a prime example of that. And I think it is a nice moment to stop the reading right here at about one hour and we will continue next next time and you maybe wonder that i still read in the introduction well that is for more than 100 pages an introduction so <laughs> it's it's quite long i already checked that but this was very very interesting to get a knowledge of the struggle between the so-called Orthodox and the Arians, the struggle between the different bishops, Athanasius, who was
banished, came back, banished, came back, banished, came back, and said of himself that once you're anathematized, there's no way back. But he was banished, anathematized, and he came back several times, making an exception only for himself, of that what he stated for others. And now with this last statement of that name is very strange <laughs> protect status a heathen who was the prefect of the city in Rome the following year said make me bishop of Rome and I'll be a Christian too I think there is no better way to end this video than with a sentence like this that we can all reflect on until the next time. And until then, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you. Thank you for watching and listening. Bye bye.